our, uh, our guest speaker is Professor Michael J. Berkner, who is, I'll make this brief, he is a, uh, he was born and raised in Bergenfield. He is a product of the Bergenfield public school system. Uh, he became a professor of history at Gettysburg College, Gettysburg, PA, and he has kindly consented to come and do this presentation about the history of Bergenfield. He's also the author of A Country Place No More. It's a book, a reference book, really, at the library that is uh, much used by, uh, by the, the public. And um, it tells a, a good hundred years of the history of Bergenfield. Uh, with that, I'd like to please ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Berkman. Well, it's a real treat to be here today. Uh, this is a special community, and it's a special place in that community for me, as I'll explain in a second. Um, I have some real memories. Uh, most of my memories in terms of the Bergenfield Public Library uh, are at the Municipal Building, and some of you are old enough to remember those days. Um, in 1964, when I turned 14, the woman who's on the picture on the right over there, Beatrice James, who happened to live across the street from my parents and me, uh, saw me in the street and said, when are you turning 14? And I said, I just turned 14 last week, Aunt B. And she said to me, go get your working papers, get your mother to take you to Hackensack. And uh, my mom was obedient, took me there, and I started working at the municipal building at a dollar an hour, shelving books. And again, for those of you who uh, are of a certain age, you'll remember the kind of books I was shelving. Uh, um, Edna Ferber, Daphne du Maurier, Ag Agatha Christie, Zane Gray, George Simenon, and the new hot books uh, like uh, Philip Roth's uh, work uh, and uh, Bell Kaufman's Up the Down Staircase, which was a big bestseller in the mid-1960s. Um, I did it all, and, and it was uh, a revelation for me uh, to be part of this really vital operation in a very busy town. Um, in 1968, uh, B. James' great vision, which had been going for years, uh, was realized, and that is this building. Um, and I was here as a senior in high school helping to move the books from the municipal building into this building. It's a very strong memory in the summer of 1968. Then I went off to college uh, and came back for many, many years because of my family ties here, uh, including my mom, who's still doing very well, though has moved just now out of Bergenfield. And, my cousin Bob and, and his wife Eva, and so many friends as well. Um, this lecture is going to be two parts. I'm going to talk with you about some of the issues involved in writing a history of Bergenfield, which may be of more interest to a student of history than a Bergenfield resident, but you're going to get it anyway. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what Bergenfield has been uh, as a community, how it has evolved as a community, as a historian sees it, and where I see Bergenfield uh, in the complex of community. And then, for the second half of the talk, I'm going to walk through uh, this PowerPoint lecture. I don't think it's quite set up right, Don, at this point. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, a PowerPoint and show you some pictures that are a sampler of Bergenfield history since the 1890s. So let me open with this point that uh, when I was given the opportunity to write the history of Bergenfield uh, in the late 1980s, uh, I thought the first thing that I might want to do would be to walk the streets, to find the living among the dead, if you will. Um, and that meant uh, going to the cemetery at the Old South Church and taking a look at those headstones uh, and trying to make some sense of how uh, an old Dutch community becomes a dynamic, multicultural community. Uh, that's really not insignificant. I walked the streets of Bergenfield as much as I could to try to get the flavor of the different sections of the town, and they do have a diff each of them has a different flavor to it, as you know yourselves from driving around. One of my first memories in terms of uh, the, the living and the dead was uh, walking down Church Street as a boy. I went to Franklin School, uh, and on the edge of the church and the church cemetery, there was a very old a gravestone with a skull and bones on it. 
And as a, as a kid, eight or nine years old, I, I was intrigued by this, because the only thing Skull and Bones really meant to me was pirates, right? Uh, and so I just didn't know what this was all about. And as I got older, I did some checking and some reading, and I realized that it, the actual grave, which I suspect you can probably not even read the stone now, but it was a grave of, a, of an infant. And it was a, just a, it was a memento mori, as they would say in Latin, uh, a, a way of remembering uh, this child and uh, the, if you will, the evanescence of life. And that, that was what the Skull and Bones was about. It wasn't anything having to do with pirates. <laughs> so I started walking the streets, but of course my research wasn't all about shoe leather. It was about other elements of the research process. I had three particular strands of research that I did uh, in trying to write what I thought would be an interesting, meaningful, and accurate history of Bergenfield. Uh, the first thing I did is something that is probably the least pleasurable activity that any historian does, and that is I sat in front of an old microfilm machine for many, many hours reading back issues of old newspapers, particularly Hackensack newspapers from the late 19th century, and then the Bergen Evening Record. Uh, the Bergen Evening Record for the period 1920 to roughly 1960 was especially rich because in the olden days, if you will, uh, Local, hit, local coverage was a central part of what the Bergen Evening Record did. And my friend Bob Armbruster, who worked for the Record uh, and then went on to an even bigger newspaper in Newark, uh, Bob knows this because he lived it, as did his brother. Bergenfield had its own correspondence for many years, and their job was to file whatever was going on in the town. Everything from somebody having a pinochle party and somebody having some visit from Colorado <laughs> to uh, mayhem on Merritt Avenue on Saturday night uh, and, and the police blotter, uh, yes, that was a factor of the 1920s and 30s, uh, to, uh, you know, the achievements uh, as well as the normal crime stories that you get uh, in the newspaper. Um, after 1940, I was able to pick up, and this was due to the good fortune of the borough administrator at the time letting me uh, into the attic of the municipal building, uh, I was able to pick up with Borough Records, but the, in the newspaper realm, they had a filing cabinet, and I opened the filing cabinet, and uh, I found a, a pretty good run of a newspaper called the Times Review, which some of you, may again, may remember, which was a weekly. It had its ups and its downs in its, its history before it went out of business uh, in the 1970s, but it really was a gold mine for me in terms of local news, because it was focused primarily on Bergenfield, Dumont, and Haworth, for whatever reason. Haworth was in the mix. But Bergenfield was kind of the top dog. And I got a lot of good material out of the Times Review. Uh, so that, that's one key strand of the research. A second key strand of the research was interviewing people, what we call oral history. Uh, over the course of the roughly five years that I worked on this project, I interviewed about 80 people, some of them multiple times. For example, I think I interviewed Bra Rewards, Bud Rewards, as you may know, uh, about five times, because Bud knew where the bodies were buried in Bergenfield. <laughs> <laughs> Literally and figuratively, right? Uh, and and uh, he was a very good source, although unfortunately Bud didn't always tell me these things that he told me on the record. So I, I have a few of them in my pocket, if you will, but I couldn't use them in the book. Um, the very first interview I did was a very meaningful interview for me, and it's a name that uh, is connected in some ways to the Bergenfield Library as well. Uh, and uh, that was the, a person who I would say, among, uh, among Bergenfield people, was as close to Mr. Bergenfield as you could find. And I think some of you know who I'm referring to, William P. Major. Uh, and Bill Major was just tremendously devoted to this community. He loved this community. He came here as a year and a half old kid from New York. and he was never going to leave. Bill got a little mad at me in the process of my interviews with him because I would pester him about the inf information he could give me about the Ku Klux Klan in Bergenfield, which was in fact a significant force in this town in the 1920s, and he just adamantly refused to accept, he knew darn well otherwise, he, but he adamantly refused to accept the premise that there was a Klan in Bergenfield. Um, even DiMaggio's mother actually gave me a very good insight into the Klan uh, in my interview with her, um, a, a piece of evidence that I thought was not just incontrovertible, but complementary to other evidence I was picking up elsewhere. But I did love Bill Major, and, and I appreciated his loyalty to his borough. 
This was a way of getting a sense of the lived experience and the texture of life in Bergenfield for so long. Uh, I want to give you a couple of little vignettes that oral history can give you. Uh, I interviewed an elderly couple, uh, obviously impoverished couple, who lived in a tiny apartment in Hickory Avenue. Uh, I don't know even how I got their names. They were very kind. And, and the thing that stuck with me was when I asked them about their memories of Bergenfield in the 1930s, uh, what they told me was that people were very close, uh, that they, they shared. And that she said that in their neighborhood, they would actually, if somebody had an extra loaf of bread, pass it on to a neighbor who had uh, a need for it. And that just touched me uh, very much. Um, I interviewed a guy named Elliot Asher, who, yes. again, if you're, well, Bob, of course, knows Elliot Asher. He was a Bergenfield resident who covered Bergenfield for the Bergen record and did a very good job of it. And when I interviewed Elliot Asher, I was very interested in. Uh, politics and, and governance things, and he told me something about Roy W. Brown that, I, that made me kind of smile because it was classic Roy Brown. Roy Brown didn't like the public nosing into affairs of education, and so what he did was he scheduled all the Board of Education meetings for the same night that the Borough Council met. Uh, and that way, Elliot, he knew Elliot Asher could only be in one place at a time, so that way Elliot couldn't cover the, because Elliot's first responsibility was the borough council meetings. So he'd go to the borough council, then he'd try to catch up later, but he could never get anything out of Roy Brown. And I thought that was just so Roy Brown. Um, and then there's the, the, the Rewerts uh, interviews, which really gave me an insight into how this borough was governed for over 35 years by, uh, with two major people, Pierce Deemer uh, and Bernie Ashenbrand. And he gave me Let's just say how the sausage was made. Some of it he wouldn't tell me for the record. Some of it I was able to corroborate from other sources. And some of it I know but can't use because I just don't want to have hearsay dominate a history work. But I certainly did get a good sense of both Deemer uh, and Ashenbrand and their operations in this town. Um, and then there was the story of integration in Bergenfield. Um, this is a story that is not necessarily uh, an easy story to tell, in part because of the lack of good sourcing. But I found a woman uh, named Lee Porter, uh, who was one of the first African Americans uh, to move to Bergenfield. Uh, and I interviewed her in her snug home in Burn Place, and she told me of how she came to Bergenfield. And by the way, it's interesting to say, when I asked her what motivated her and her family, which they lived in East Orange, I asked her, what, why Bergenfield, as opposed to some other place? And she said, because I heard that Bergenfield had really good schools. Uh, and she said, and that's what brought us there. And she was able to find this house that she liked. And then, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't all pleasantness. Because people in the neighborhood, when they saw them coming and checking out the house, made it clear they didn't want them there. And then when uh, the week before she was to move in, she went in to go and get some things in the house uh, a mob came together, and people started shouting not nice things, including, uh, Bergenfield's not ready for integration. And this woman, who was a very spunky woman, looked at uh, the person who shouted it and said, well, guess what? Ready or not, here we come. <laughs> and, and the good part of this story uh, is that her family not only had a good experience in Bergenfield, but she also told me that she didn't want me to get the wrong idea that it was all one way. She said people drove to their, from Bergenfield, drove to their home in East Orange before they made the move and told them, we will welcome you to Bergenfield. And people, when they came in, did treat her and her family the way they should be treated. So it's, it's a two-sided story. And uh, she told me a few other things about the, the trials and tribulations of their kids going to Bergenfield High. But in the end, she was very satisfied that she had moved to Bergenfield. And she said that her kids did very well here. And she had no regrets about being in Bergenfield. Uh, and so did the fellow who was the first African American who was elected to the Board of Education in Bergenfield. Maybe he's still the only African American who served in the Board of Education. Uh, my friend from River Edge Road, whose name I'm now forgetting, Bobby. Hi, Cal, Cal Hart. Cal Hart. And Cal just loved Bergenfield. And Cal told me that you know he was never going anywhere else. Uh, so 
I'll tell you a, a Ku Klux Klan story here because it comes out of the oral history. Some of you remember another friend of the Bergenfield Library named Barbara Wolf. And Barbara was a, was a wonderful person, uh, very active at St. John's Church. Uh, she was a very fine educator in Hackensack. She could have been the principal uh, of any number of schools in Bergenfield, but she chose to keep at her career in Hackensack. Uh, I asked a lot of questions of Barbara, including what she knew about the Ku Klux Klan in Bergenfield. And I said, I said uh, I've heard mixed responses about this. And she says, oh, there was a Klan in Bergenfield. And I said, well, how do you know, Barbara? She says, well, it's like this, she said. Uh, uh, the mayor of Bergenfield, Charles Grabowski, lived across the street from us. And he was in the Klan. And I said, well, what do you mean he was in the Klan? How do you know that? And she says, well, she says, it's like this. She said, the Klan met on Sunday nights, and on Monday morning, <coughs> Mrs. Grabowski put his Klan out regalia out on the line. <laughs> now, that's pretty good evidence, wouldn't you say? Uh, pretty good testimony. Uh, so I ran with that. The third essential element of my research uh, was reliance on what we in history call primary sources, documents, uh, often original documents, most of which I found at the time in the attic of the municipal building. And I should get some kind of an award for being in that attic in 90 degree heat in the summer when I had the chance to be there with all kinds of uh, other little um, animals up there and so forth. <laughs> but it was a godsend. It was a godsend. Now I have to say something really sad here because I found this to be the invaluable element of my research and I went to the then director of the library and to the then borough manager and I said you need to find a way to get these documents into a place that is climate controlled and safe. I took them there. I badgered them to the point where I, I had them come. And they just didn't listen. And a year after I had this conversation, the then mayor of Bergenfield decided he wanted a Garfield the Drum and Bugle Corps to inhabit that space. And they threw every bit of it in the dumpsters. And, I, and it happens that there's a person in this room who shared that with me. And uh, he was as sad about it as am I. Let me say further that what they did was not just a violation of history, it was criminal. Because I've talked since to the former archivist of the state of New Jersey, and he said that destroying these kinds of records is a criminal act. And Bergenfield's history is much poorer for not having these records, which were incredibly rich. Now what is it? What, what, what was lost? Think about this. All the borough's records from 1894 into the 1960s of police, health care, tax collection, zoning, planning, relations with federal and state authorities, the New Deal programs that enabled us to get Cooper's Pond into the state that it became in, all of this is gone. All of the mayor's photographs were framed and up there in the municipal building. And my cousin Pete Marsilio actually witnessed them being destroyed. And it makes me mad now. But it is what it is. And I guess you can say that um, you have my book. And my book uses a lot of these documents. And at least we have the story that came out of them. I have a, I should have said at the very beginning that one of the things that I'm proud of in being here today is my brother John is here. And he's the mayor of Westwood. And uh, I hope that, I've never told John this story, I don't think, but uh, I trust you're going to make sure that the Westwood records are in better condition <laughs> than the Bergenfield ones. Um, they are climate controlled and, and archived. <laughs> right? we, we appreciate that. Um, these records really give us a fascinating reading on the history of Bergenfield. Uh, how in the 1940s, Prospect Avenue gets turned from being a quiet, almost farming type lane uh, into a modern thoroughfare with a gas station at the corner of Prospect and Main Street, for example. It's a wonderful letter, now I'm sure destroyed, from the man who lived across the street from the new gas station, in, in which he complains to the borough council 
uh, about the fact that his quiet enjoyment of the country air on Prospect Avenue was being undermined by the installation of this gas station and how he was going to think about moving. Uh, of course, we know Prospect Avenue is not a quiet thoroughfare anymore. I also, uh, in these records, found the records uh, of the soft vaccine distribution in Bergenfield. And this is a special meeting for me because one of my first memories as a boy, one of my very first memories, is having my dad walk me from our, from our James Street apartment to Washington School where Dr. Lombardi, who was a, the town health officer, I think inoculated me uh, for polio as a big deal. you got to remember, in the early 1950s, there was a major epidemic of polio. Uh, and uh, the soft vaccine, which President Eisenhower made available to families at no cost, uh, was, a, was a way of preventing that particular scourge from hitting more children, including people, uh, some of the people who are in this room. That was a very personal piece of history for me. Borough records on infrastructure were very informative. Uh, did you know that there were actually tree stumps on Main Street and Washington Avenue in the 1890s that they had to occasionally drive around and then ultimately pull out? Uh, or that in the uh, part of the town that's closest to Tenafly, uh, the eastern part of the town, you had many brooks and streams that were ultimately covered over as development and housing was built on, on those sites. Uh, some people who have water in their basements can appreciate that. Uh, and then for those of you who live near Vivian Field, you may know that there was a sewage disposal plant uh, near Vivian Field. And this, as Al Strews told me when I interviewed him, because he bought a house in that neighborhood, uh, in the summer it could be uh, hellacious. Uh, and that, of course, fortunately, is a, is a piece of old history. But it was in the documents. So, having given you that little rundown of my research effort, let me say a few words about Bergenfield um, and the journey that I took and what I learned. Bergenfield's story has at least two notable beginnings. The first one, of course, is the early, early story, the Huguenot settlement of Schrallenberg, uh, Dutch and French uh, farmers coming to Bergenfield uh, in many cases to escape what they thought was intolerance toward their religious practice. They weren't especially tolerant either, but they wanted to be free to, to, to practice religion their way. And that story is told very felicitously in uh, Adrian Leiby's The Huguenot Settlement of Schrallenberg, which was sponsored by this library in the 1960s and published in connection with the Tercentenary in 1964. Uh, I want to also put a plug in for the fact that there's another book, a little less easy to read, but still a valuable book about uh, early Bergen County history that connects to Bergenfield, and that is the sons of William Major, John Major, who is a very fine historian, and his brother David, who is an engineer, but also a very smart guy, wrote a history of the Demarest family in Bergen County, going back to the 17th century up into the 20th century. And that Demarest family um, story is not a Bergenfield story per se until you get one of the Demarests moves to Bergenfield in the late 19th century and establishes the first store in Bergenfield on Main Street uh, and the Jay-Z Demarest store where basically you got what you needed from him. The second notable framing point in Bergenfield history is the incorporation of the borough uh, in, in 1894. And I think, if, let's see, I forget how we move this forward. Will we? You just put the mouse or? Yeah, there, there's the, the borough seal. Uh, incorporated 1894. And you have what is called a borough mania or a borough craze that happens in the 1890s. It has to do with a state law that made it, for tax purposes, more re realistic for in unincorporated villages to incorporate as boroughs and towns and townships all over the state. And so you had something like 40 villages in Bergen County incorporated as did Bergenfield, as did Dumont, all during the 1890s. And it seemed to me that given that Adrian Leiby's book really lost steam and he lost interest uh, at the point of incorporation, that given that this was going to be the 100th anniversary book for Bergenfield, it made most sense for me to do a quick backdrop on the town's history and then uh, move it forward from the, the incorporation forward. And that's what I did. Uh, it seemed to me that the story was moving a country place like Bergenfield, where as Bill Major said, you could come and breathe fresh air and have elbow room, 
uh, to a, a very different kind of community than it was by 1994. In my epilogue to, to my book, I referred to Bergenfield as in some ways re reminiscent of Queens, New York. And, it, and I make this comment now because just about three weeks ago, the New York Times had a real estate section article, so you want to live in Bergenfield, and the writer of that article said Bergenfield reminded him of Queens, New York. So I thought that was quite an interesting thing. Um, so a word about what's in the book. Um, it's about transformational community change from, we're talking about population or demographics, economics, politics, the built environment. All of this transformed radically over the course of a century. In 1900, Bergenfield was a bustling commuter town building up along the axis of Main Street and Washington Avenue. Now, I'll do a couple of things here, and then we'll do more later. Uh, this, is a, this image of the train station is critical to understanding Bergenfield's development, because the ability of New York commuters uh, to get in and out of Bergenfield was essential. And the, the West Shore Line, which was established in the late 1870s, uh, is critical to the development of Bergenfield and Dumont. Uh, and that's the same spot that I believe the current uh, Disabled American Vets building is right, right now. Is that right, Bob? So, so uh, you couldn't have Bergenfield without the trains. Um, it was a community of small farms, by and large. Uh, in 1967, a man by the name of Fred Tours, who was a friend of, of Adrian Leiby, uh, drew by hand, and I'll show it to you in a minute. In fact, I can rip through and show it to you now. Um, look at that. Is, is New Bergenfield in, say, 1890? That's Washington Avenue. Recognize that? <laughs> There's the church before the 20th century. Can't really see a lot of detail here, but... Let me point out, these little circles right here, these are different farms that were in Bergenfield. And these farms were only a couple of acres each. So what Fred Tours is describing is what the streets were in 1905, as he remembered them as a boy. And uh, I think it's actually a marvelous evocation uh, of the time gone by. If any of you have in your attics a copy of the 75th anniversary Twinborough News, uh, this map is on the cover uh, of that uh, particular newspaper. Uh, and it's really a great image of Bergenfield as a country town. Now, of course, by the time I'm writing my book, it's a very different place. It's a crowded, multicultural community, although a place where people could settle and make great lives. So why does Bergenfield develop as Bergenfield, as opposed to as a Tenafly or an Englewood or, or another town? And clearly, topography has something to do with that. Uh, if you have driven around, you know that our borough is largely level. And that made it very easy to do a New York-style grid in Bergenfield of 25-foot frontages, just as was common in New York City. In Tenafly and Englewood, you've got the hills, right? And you simply can find more uneven properties properties that you can expand a lot more, and that's what happens, and that's why Tenafly and, and Englewood look a lot different than Bergenfield does. Even Dumont has a little bit more hilly terrain than we do. Uh, so what we have in Bergenfield is a setup whereby people could come out from the city, buy their 25-foot lot, but nobody's going to be next door to them, so they still have a lot of elbow room to grow a garden or have the kids play, mow a lawn, whatever they want to do. In some cases, they bought a second 25-foot lot, which ultimately, in the end, due to taxes, would be sold off and a house would be built on it. And that's a story, again, many of the old-timers here are familiar with. When I was a boy, uh, I used to walk down Harcourt Avenue to go to my elementary school, and there was a crossing guard uh, named William Krauss uh, who uh, lived right on Harcourt Avenue on the corner of Harcourt and Stoughton. And he had a very pleasant little country house, and his side lot, he grew a magnificent garden. And he had that all during my childhood. Uh, and of course, when he died, the lot was sold off and a house was built on it. And that was sort of a classic story all through the community. Uh, so that the, the town becomes less, less of an elbow room kind of town. Um, 
The World War II, post-World War II suburban boom, of course, is critically important in understanding why Bergenfield is like it is. Bergenfield is closer to New York City than the Northern Valley towns, including my brother's town of Westwood. And so uh, you're going to get a lot more migration simply because of proximity. In those days, taking a bus into the city from Bergenfield was an easy deal. And as someone who go, used to go into Columbia University on a regular basis over the last decade or more, it was not the same easy deal because it would take an hour and 15 minutes to get from Bergenfield uh, into Port Authority because of the traffic you would get uh, in, among the buses in the morning. That wasn't the way it was in, say, 1950. It did not seem crowded, it seemed very easy, and the prices of the homes were, were modest. Um, one of the people I interviewed for, for my book was again a library person, Beverly Katz. And Beverly uh, liked to remind me when I would say how everything seemed crowded. She said, well, Michael, the houses are, are pretty much normal sized houses in Bergenfield, so don't emphasize how small things are. And I said, yes, Beverly, I said, but those houses are crowded out to very, very small lots as compared to what you're going to see when you just cross the border into New Milford or into Tenafly. And, uh, and so I think we had a, a, a standoff, a Mexican standoff on that issue. But we're both right. Uh, <laughs> what kind of a town was Bergenfield in the 20th century? That invites subjective observations and comments. Every person is entitled to their own opinion about what this community represents. I wrestled with it in writing my book, um, and I can't say I came up with a perfectly satisfactory analysis because there are so many different layers to the story. In terms of socioeconomics, it always uh, has been too easy to call Bergenfield a, quote, working class town. Um, because many people, when you think working class, you think blue collar. Uh, but many people in Bergenfield over the years uh, have put on white shirts and ties and gone into the city or gone to neighboring communities and, and made their livings in white collar jobs. So calling Bergenfield a working class town is not quite perfect. Uh, a writer who wrote a book about Bergenfield uh, in wake of the teenage suicides in the 1980s called it an upper poor town, whatever that means. But in, but in fact, if she had bothered to look at the census records, she'd find out that Bergenfield doesn't fit that definition if you simply look at uh, what people were making and what kinds of jobs that they had. Um, middle class doesn't quite work either because an awful lot of Bergenfield people uh, have been uh, at what I would call the margins of the middle class at best, where they're just trying to get by paycheck to paycheck, uh, doing jobs that don't seem to have lots of opportunity for, for upward <coughs> mobility. I interviewed a, a historian who grew up uh, in Teaneck, and I, and I said to him, what's your perception of Bergenfield? And he said, oh, he said, it's like this. My relatives in Teaneck were all lawyers uh, and professional people. My Bergenfield relatives were all plumbers and electricians. Now, he wasn't saying it in a derogatory way. He was trying to give me his sense of Bergenfield. And there is something to that. And let me, let me add to this. It's interesting comment on Bergenfield, isn't it, that we have in our town a very fancy tennis club on Pelham Place called Adik, that no Bergenfield person has ever been a member of, <laughs> that we have a very fancy golf country club that includes Bergenfield, and how many Bergenfield people have ever belonged to that country club. Murph. Murph, but that's it. <laughs> so that to me is indicative of something. Now I'll tell you where I sort of came up, uh, came down on this. Um, uh, I found an interview in a, in a local paper after the suicides in which somebody asked a, a police officer in Bergenfield by the name of Donald Stump if he could describe Bergenfield for him in a, in a word. And Stump said, it's like this, he said, you see the color of the uniform I'm wearing? He said, it's light blue. And I thought, I can't improve on that. And that's what I said in my book, that Bergenfield is a light blue community. Of course, there's a lot more to defining any community than socioeconomics. Bergenfield people have always been very proud of their schools, energetic and, and uh, 
self-sacrificing and providing athletic and, and musical opportunities for their young people. I mean, even as a boy, I knew, I knew that there was something special about uh, music in Bergenfield. And uh, Bobby and Eva, you remember Donald Angelica and what an incredible uh, force he was for that. Uh, I remember going to concerts when I was in junior high at the high school at Goosebumps when Angelica would lead in his most energetic way uh, the, the, the orchestra. Um, it's, a, it's a community that I've noticed has always been very generous to people who needed help, particularly in times of tragedy where there's a fire or a flood or something like that. People have always been available. It's not a, it's not a you know, fancy dancy kind of town. It's a town of people who are neighbors and who act like it. And that means something. And then think about the contributions of the volunteers uh, who make possible the Little League and the PAL and the high school marching band and so forth and so on uh, succeed as they have. Um, <clears throat> still goes on. Hasn't changed. That's been a, a, a constant in this town. The service clubs are struggling, as they are all across the United States. Uh, but there are all kinds of service clubs still operating in Bergenville and still doing what they do, and they do it well. And when it comes to spirit, who does better parades than Bergen? <laughs> right? Uh, whether it's the Memorial Day Parade or the, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, uh, Bergenfield's parades are the best. Uh, so I, I don't want you to understand my book as being a muckraking book. It's a book that tries to tell the story whole, to tell the story honestly. So when there are people who are corrupt, or there's a Ku Klux Klan in Bergenfield, or, they, or there's this wanton devastation of, of our built environment heritage, which is what happened without anybody really paying much attention to it or caring much about it, I'm going to call it out, because that's part of our history. But the side of Bergenfield I just described to you, which is the, the side of a community where people care about others, that I'm going to call out too. One final point before I talk about the uh, pictures. Um, one thing that makes Bergenfield uh, distinctive is its walking community nature. And, I, I, and one of the things I feel most pleased about in thinking about my childhood is how I walked from near the New Milford border to a municipal building four days a week to work here, work at the public library. I walked, I didn't think anything about it. Or I rode my bike up to play PAL baseball uh, on the border with Tenafly, right? I didn't think anything about it. Or to my grandmother's house on Warren Street where my, my cousin Pat lives now. And that was a part of my ritual in my life. And, and, and I was just one person because everybody was doing this kind of thing. My brother was doing it, my cousin Bob was doing it, and my friends were doing it too. You go up, think about the ritual in Bergenfield with a parent's birthday coming up, or Mother's Day, or Christmas, going up to Florence Shop and shopping at Florence Shop and getting something for your parent and being able to walk home with it. Uh, that was, to me, one of the treasures of being in Bergenfield. You can even call Bergenfield a little oasis of domestic safety, at least for much of its history, a comfortable place in a dangerous world. Now, nobody is completely safe in life. We know that. There's no utopia, and Bergenfield ain't a utopia. But I, in concluding my, my first half of my remarks, I, I want to emphasize that uh, Bergenfield has done well by its residents, and its residents have done well by it which is to say that it, it has served two different purposes in life for people. It served as a place for people who are good citizens to come and put down roots and stay and contribute to the community. And it served as a step on the ladder of upward mobility for many who start in Bergenfield and for one reason or another aspire to something else and move to that something else. But I think that's an American story and I think it's a pretty good story. So having told you that, I'm going to show you some pictures. And we'll, we'll walk through, let's see if I can, actually I'll do it from the podium because you can hear me better. So that's the map that Fred Tours did. And uh, I'm sorry that you can't see it better, but it is still a good indicator of small farm Bergenfield. This is what Bergenfield uh, looked like from the steeple of the Old South Church. Uh, around, and that's, that's pointing uh, you know, toward the New Milford border. 
so you can see how undeveloped that was. That was a farming territory. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the things I discovered, you all know about Macy's, right? Well, the Macy's uh, people were the Strausses. And the Strausses owned a big parcel of land in that area where they had horses. And they, they never moved to Bergenfield, but, but they had a horse farm in Bergenfield in the early 20th century. Now, here's another view from the Old South Church. You can see the, the old stones, the gravestones. That, of course, is all built up now. This is one of the key figures in Bergenfield history. It's Walter Christie as a young man. That picture was taken around 1894. Uh, Walter Christie was, of course, the fellow who founded the Christie Agency. He founded the Bergenfield National Bank. He was really one of the great powers that be in Bergenfield. He also, it's worth noting, was a power that be in Bergen County. He was on the uh, Board of Freeholders. He was on every committee that the county had. He was a formidable individual. He was a very crusty, conservative man. He named his kids for conservative politicians. Uh, and, and he named his streets in Bergenfield, Cleveland, for, for Grover Cleveland, and Carlisle for John G. Carlisle, who was the Secretary of the Treasury and a gold buck very strong gold bug. So Walter Christie understood hard money. He was an exemplar of that kind of old Dutch uh, conservatism. But he was also a community-oriented person, and he was behind just about every major initiative to improve this borough. So I should emphasize that. Uh, Dagmar, that's your street. Yeah. <laughs> that is Holberg Avenue in around 1900. Uh, so, a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of change, I would say. I, I, when I saw that, I thought of you, Dag. Uh, this is uh, uh, from Central Avenue, a view, and this is one of these brooks that has disappeared over time as development has taken over Bergenfield. Isn't that amazing? Uh, here's the old mill pond in the early 20th century. You can see the, the church uh, graveyard in the background. By the way, the church owned all of the land that we now think of up to the water line uh, at Cooper's Pond. And in the 1930s, when the borough got federal money to build up Cooper's Pond, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, the, the church very kindly donated a large chunk of that land to the borough so that it could do this. Here's another village, a view of the old mill pond. You can see some of the, uh, the mill in the background. Just, just a great shot. This is a typical Bergenfield dwelling. I'm, I'm thinking this may be on Prospect Avenue towards New Milford uh, but, or Dumont, but I'm not 100% sure. But it is, it's just great in terms of capturing a, a sort of a, a slice of life. Now, I don't know if you can read the script, but I, but I did write it out. We, the undersigned taxpayers of the village of Bergenfield, desiring to be brought from darkness into light, and believing it would be conducive to the best interests of all, do hereby petition your honorable body to furnish light on Hickory Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> and they got their light. So I just showed you. Uh, speak up. <laughs> Bergenfield's first public school, uh, as a borough anyway, was the Washington School, very handsome school, built in 1905. Um, and Franklin School would not be far behind it because Franklin would uh, of course, service the people on the other side of the community. There's a very early shot of Franklin School. Um, one of my favorite uh, vignettes, again, you get so many from interviewing people, is I interviewed Walter Christie uh, III, who ran the Christie Agency for many years in this town. And I asked him about his childhood, and I said, what's your favorite memory or most distinctive memory? And he says, it was a January morning on the second floor of Franklin School, uh, looking out the window to see whether or not the ice was, was formed on the pond so that I could run home and get my skates, because uh, they lived right off of Church Street, run home and get my skates and get out and skate. And I, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's the life. Um, this, this is the Episcopal Church uh, of Bergenfield, uh, and this would be probably around 1910. The church was founded earlier than that, but again, you get a sense of just how rustic the community was. Uh, this is, a, a, you don't have to read this letter, but I thought it was interesting because Walter Christie, among other things, rented his building to the borough council um, uh, for $100 a year for their meetings. 
And he was writing to them in May of, of 1909 and saying, uh, he's been furnishing electric lights and fuel and a janitor, which only left him with $75 for the whole year, so he wanted more money. Uh, so he was raising it to a, his rent to $120 uh, for the year. Mr. Administrator, remember that. Uh, you're saving all that money with your building now. Uh, the Demarest family is a well-known family in Bergenfield. I mentioned Jay-Z Demarest before, who ran the, the, the store, the country store on Main Street. I don't know what his relation to Charles was, but I suspect they were related in some way. Charles was a builder, uh, and he built a house first on Washington Avenue, and then he built a house which is still standing on Prospect, right at the corner of Prospect in Maine, uh, where he lived for many years with his family. This is Charles at the reins of this, uh, around 1915. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he's up to, but it gives you, again, a sense of what a country town Bergenfield was at that time. When my grandmother moved to Bergenfield from Greenwich Village in 1919, after she married my grandfather, John, whose father had uh, built a home in Bergenfield in 1915, I said to my grandmother, so what did, what did you make of, of Bergenfield uh, when you moved here in 1919? And she didn't miss a beat, she said, oh, she said it was so countrified, I couldn't stand it, uh, because she was from the bustle and hustle of New York City. Uh, and this is what Bergenfield looks like about the time uh, of 1910 or 1915. Uh, that's Main Street, folks. Um, and you can see, we have a few remnants of that still. If you think where Woolworths was, right behind it, there's now a single family home still on Main Street. And there are a couple of other houses uh, from dating back from that era. Here's a, here's a view of Washington Avenue. I'm guessing around World War I. Um, and you can see we have a drugstore and we have some housing. And it's starting to look like it's taking shape as a commercial uh, center of the town. Uh, here's another view of Washington Avenue. I don't have a date for this one. And I, and I imagine somebody doing real research could figure out what house that is. I'm wondering if this is the dentist's office that's near Clinton Avenue, because I think that is still standing on Washington Avenue. Somebody could sort of do a little investigation of that. It could be. But you can see that it hadn't been much developed beyond. Here we have the Alert Fire Company, number one, which was on Church Street, uh, circa 1920. And, uh, they would ultimately move down Church Street to where they are now. This is, this is near St. John's Church. Um, and they had their early equipment. <coughs> this is the building that was rented out. I got this from Bar Reworks, as you can see. This was the building that was being rented out uh, by Walter Christie, I think, for the uh, borough council. Uh, and became the Christie agency for many, many years. Now this is an example. Th this picture, I can't date it, but I I'm wondering if this might be as the pond got basically crummier, uh, which it did in the 1920s. It became harder to uh, uh, freeze over because there was so much silt and other garbage in it. And that would be one of the bases for renovation in the 1930s, thanks to the New Deal. Here's Prospect Avenue in 1925. You can see what a country look it had. Um, and farms still in Prospect Avenue at that time. Harding School, built in, uh, I think, 1922 or 23. Um, Harding School um, was uh, an elementary and junior high school for many years. Uh, it became uh, the high school in 1942. Uh, until then, Bergenfield people went to Dumont or Tenafly High School. Um, but they built the wings on it in 1942, I think, and that's how they were able to accommodate a high school class. Um, it's a handsome looking school there, now called Roy Brown. Here's the Borough Hall that preceded the one that we are now in, uh, and it's on Washington Avenue, and uh, Murph, you pointed out where it was, right? Next to, near the Nollwood Inn. Mm -hmm. Palace Theater, certainly a Bergenfield landmark. <laughs> I, and I found it interesting, because there's a Pops Ambulance thing there, and we always called it, when I was a kid, Pop's Freehouse. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and there was a guy named Stahl, who was the kind of the manager of it, and he was a character. And he would give us kids the business. We, would, we actually sometimes had lines. The young people in this audience, there aren't any, so I guess I shouldn't say that, really. But we, we had lines that went down to Portland Avenue. Uh, and when we were going to see uh, just 
you know, a big John Wayne film or, or a Journey to the Center of the Earth, I remember, or something like that. And he would give us kids such a business about it. We acted up, which of course we acted up. That's what kids did. But he was quite something. And that, this was built in the, in the 1927, I think it was. And it really was a palace with a whole Turkish motif in the inside. And there's another view of it. And you can see uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was the star of the film that was being portrayed. I believe this is in the early 1930s. This is Washington Avenue. You can see how built up it is getting. When the developer, Bernard McFadden, came to town to give a speech to the Chamber of Commerce in the late 20s, the first thing he said was, you have a real lot of town here. And I thought, that's right, Bergenfield was a real, the 20s was a big time for Bergenfield. This is Bernard McFadden's operation, building Bergen Manor. So anybody who lives uh, just off of Graphic Boulevard, you will know that you live in what was to be Bergen Manor. And the idea here was that the George Washington Bridge was going to be built. There was going to be a big explosion of population across the bridge to Bergenfield and other towns like it. And so he bought up a big piece of property running uh, to the New Milford border. And he was going to build country homes uh, there and at reasonable prices. And, and he was going to clean up doing this. Uh, and here's the ad that he ran in January 1930, which is a meaningful date. Um, right. This charming home. By the way, there, this home, if you're interested, is still standing on Stoughton Street, just off of Main Street, uh, one block away from uh, Prospect Avenue and the and the and the Bergenfield uh, Franklin School. But he sketches out here how. Home ownership was the way for people to go, and all you needed to have was $500 down, and you could have a charming country home. Now, the January 1930 date is meaningful because, as you probably know, the stock market crashed in October of 29. It took a few months before people realized, wait a minute, this is going to have a big impact. And in fact, the stock market crash was the prelude to the Great Depression. So nobody was buying homes in the 1930s, or very few people were, because people were often unemployed. What they didn't stop doing was doing parades. And here you have the, a parade passing by Hickory Avenue in 1930. So Burgerfield's always had this ingrained in it. Here's another view of the parade, uh, marching down Washington Avenue. Um, this is a little piece of what I found in the attic in the Borough Hall. Um, these men reported to Harding School grounds cutting grass. So there was a state employment program for unemployed people, and these three people signed up to get work and be paid something for it, in this case, cutting grass. And the New Deal would do this on a grand scale through the WPA and the CCC and, and the other alphabet soup agencies, which, by the way, Bergenfield was not enthusiastic about because Bergenfield was run by very conservative Republicans who didn't like the federal government at all. And it took five years for them to essentially concede that the federal government could do something for Bergenfield. They didn't apply for monies, whereas other towns around us were applying for monies. The one exception was for Lincoln School. I believe we did get some money for Lincoln School. Here's Walter Christie and his sons. Uh, they were among the power brokers in Bergenfield. Jack Christie, who ran the insurance agency, was he's on the left. Uh, I, no, no, Jack's on the right, far right. He was probably the big man behind the scene in the 1930s. Um, his other son ran a coal company in Bergenfield, and, I, and the third son, I think, was in banking. And the Christies were associated with Bergenfield for many, many years. Walter, as you could imagine, is, is the old man, the center. Now here are the powers behind the throne for the next decade, and then the one on the left for decades to come. That's Pierce Deemer on the left and, and Mayor Frank Jones. Frank Jones is probably one of the most formidable mayors Bergenfield had. He was a, a, a banker with manufacturer Hanover Trust in New York, lived in Bergenfield, I think on Murray Hill Terrace, not sure, um, and got involved as a councilman and then served as mayor for nine years. Uh, he was a smart guy, very conservative, but he knew his business, and he, and he did the borough uh, very good work. Pierce Steemer was a very ambitious attorney uh, who wanted to get ahead, ran for state legislature four or five times uh, before he was uh, put on the Republican organization's ticket and got elected. Um, and he was named borough attorney in the mid-1930s and remained the borough attorney until 1972 or 1973, elected on an annual basis. And if there's any one person 
who is responsible for why Bergenfield looks the way it does, it's Pierce Steamer. And it's because Pierce Steamer got a piece of the action for every house that was built in Bergenfield, and he wanted as many houses as possible to be built in Bergenfield. He did it all legally, the same way Walter Jones at the county level got a piece of the action for every sewer line that was laid in Bergen County in the 1950s and 60s. That's why Walter Jones was a multimillionaire. And it was all done legally. Um, didn't have to be a crook. This is what the old mill pond looked like in 1937. It was increasingly small, silt-filled, unusable. And that's when the borough council realized it needed to get some money from the feds to do something, and this was the perfect project. So they got $87,000 from the federal government, and they hired a lot of unemployed people, and over the course of uh, six months, they transformed uh, Cooper's Pond into something really nice. And it has remained, of course, a, uh, one of the, the iconic uh, parts of Bergenfield. Um, Here's a smaller example of, again, the kind of research I dug into. This is getting the funds to pave Prospect Avenue in 1939. It was, it was paved in 1940. Again, federal money. Now, you might think this picture is of where I live in Adams County, Pennsylvania. But actually, this is Baker Street uh, and the Baker Farm uh, in Bergenfield in World War II. This picture was given to me by Mary Peterson, a longtime librarian here. Because uh, she lived on Baker Avenue, and she wanted me to see what her neighborhood looked like when she first moved in. Is that amazing? And now, of course, it's dotted with, with single-family homes. Uh, this is uh, at the crossroads, I believe, of Washington Avenue and Main Street around World War II. Um, maybe, yeah, could be a little before, a little after, but there you go. That's a little, little scene of the town. And this is during World War II. They put up this roll of honor of the Bergenfield boys who served in the war. Uh, and there were a lot of them, and of course some of them didn't come home. And as you know, uh, the Galleones and others have put a lot of time and effort into memorializing these people by, by putting up these wonderful banners through the town and by, of course, naming our parks uh, for the, the fallen veterans of different wars. This is uh, St. John's Church before the construction of the new church. Remember that? Yes. Um, remember crusty Father McGurk? <laughs> I remember Father McGurk. <laughs> he was a piece of work. Um, Station Square in the mid-1940s had a tree in the middle of the street. How do you like that? There's the post office on the right. I think my next image will give you an interesting view also. No, I guess maybe I didn't put it. They, in 1946, they actually did a schematic uh, on Station Square of building an overpass over the train tracks so that the people could move because we had so many trains coming in at that time. Of course, people were thinking in terms of World War II with all the trains. The train tonnage declined dramatically, and then passenger train, uh, you know, what would you call patronage, declined dramatically in the 1950s, and then the West Shore Railroad ended its service in the late 50s. This is the Reworks Memorial Home in 1945. Um, it had been run by a man named Edward Meyer for a number of years, who became mayor of Bergenfield in the 1950s. He sold it to, to Bud Rewerts in uh, the summer of 1945, and that's what it looked like. And one of the things Bud told me that he learned about being a good entrepreneur was never make a big renovation, a total renovation. He said, you want to get maximum publicity, so always do a little renovation and maximum publicity, and then keep doing little ones. And I said, well, where'd you learn that? He said, Florence Everhart taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here it is. This is the drawing of the overpass at, uh, at Station Square. Uh, and uh, I found this in the planning records. Uh, and again, they're gone. But that was never built, as you know. Instead, they wound up building an underpass, which I remember as a kid was always littered with graffiti and other things. Yeah. The blizzard of 47. Uh -huh. There's Washington Avenue. Uh, it's kind of in law as one of the great blizzards of all time. Here's the Bergenfield National Bank in the early 1950s, where so it moved across the street into a big building. Walter Christie took over the bank and turned it into the Christie Agency. <clears throat> the polio vaccine that I referred to uh, as people are getting their shots. Uh, Here's a downtown scene, late 1950s. The reason I know this is the late 1950s is if you look at the marquee of the Palace Theater, um, it's uh, the film Lolita, and that wasn't uh, shown until the late 1950s. 
before that, my mom has told me that where that says lampshades, I think that area, oh no, it's still there, the chocolate shop. She used to go to the chocolate shop, and it was immediately adjacent to uh, the theater. theater. That's right. I never remember that. 1962, we're getting to the end, folks, so you've been patient with me. 1962, Great Blaze downtown. There's the anchor store I've been referring to, the Florence shop, much missed, right? Uh, yeah. Florence was a genius. And I have talked to people from other communities throughout Bergen County over the years. And if I ever mention I'm from Bergenfield, they all mean, the first thing they ever say is Florence shop. Oh, we thought we shopped in the Florence shop. People from Ridgewood, even, and they're snobby as could be, they shopped in the Florence shop. <laughs> Washington Avenue and Main Street, circa 1960. Is that great? Um, that was, by the way, the site of the home of Dr. Pitkin, one of the greatest people who ever lived in Bergenfield, who invented essentially spinal anesthesia and was, was a uh, founder of Holy Name Hospital. And Dr. Pitkin was also a bit of an entrepreneur, so when, he had, when Bergenfield was developing, he sold out, or he leased his, actually he leased his property to several stores, including Woolworths, uh, and did well. Unfortunately, while he was operating on a patient, he came down with appendicitis, and he finished the operation, and this was in 1943, and they couldn't save him. He was only in his 50s. Twinborough Park, those of you who live in a certain end of town know about this. This was the original design for it. Didn't quite work out this way, um, but it still was an important piece of property for Bergenfield and Dumont. As you probably know, there was a lot of hassle between the two boroughs about who was going to get what percentage of the land. Bergenfield wound up getting about 62% and uh, Dumont 38% uh, for anybody who cares. Uh, and both communities have used it in the ways that they saw fit. A nice image of uh, Cooper's Pond. And then, of course, we should really end with the Bergenfield Library. Uh, this is the building that I remember helping us to move into. And of course, you're in a much bigger and, and uh, more contemporary facility now. And then that's it. Uh, Cooper's Pond today. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Michael, you mentioned Barbara Wolf. She was principal of Jefferson School. Of That's right. She could have been the superintendent <coughs> of the school, so I, mis I misspoke. And, and she, she chose to defer to Donald Jess. And she stated she was assistant superintendent at Hackensack, and they invited her to to be superintendent here. So you're you're absolutely correct. Yes, sir. How did Bergenfield get its name? Because well, it was actually the first slide that I slipped over too fast. Uh, it was called Bergen Fields by a number of people, um, and uh, it was uh, actually given the name Bergenfield by, if I understand correctly, a railroad uh, uh, schedule maker. He had to put something on the schedule for where the, the West Shore Railroad stop would be between two towns. And Bergen Field is what he wrote, and it stuck. Is there a train yes. Station? Well, there, say, um, there was a fellow called Kandari. Yes, he yes. <laughs> 222 North Sweden Street, as he used to say when he got yeah, out of the council meetings. Right, yes, and uh, if it wasn't for his putting up the fight against the library, yeah, yes. the library went out, and that's what we have today, instead of a room in the uh, oh. hall. Well, you're, you're quite right. I mean, I knew Mr. Kandari, because I used to, as a boy, I was so nerdy, I, I not only was a page in the library, I used to go to borough council meetings on a regular basis. And I wound up becoming a councilman in my town, and, and so my brother and I have, uh, have both uh, gone in that direction. Um, Mr. Kandari was an honest, principled person, but his gadflyism probably resulted in this building being smaller than it was originally going to be, because the original design was for this to be a bigger building, and he just kept harping on the fact that it was going to, quote, bankrupt Bergenfield. So they did get the building here, but I don't think Mr. Kandari was a positive force there or in other things. And that's just the way it was. Uh, he, he was a libertarian. He did not believe in spending government money on things for the public good. He thought people could go buy their own books. This was Campbell Court at one time. What's that? This was a deed it was. I remember that as a kid in the 50s. Mike, I'd like to add something to this, and I can speak to it. 
the Democratic Party had a split then, and with their group called Brennan, the Brennan people who yeah, now want to line the library. Now I'm a Democrat, but the best thing that the Republicans did is they fought off the Democrats trying to stop this building, and uh, it was Jim O'Dowd and, and those people, and, and even the uh, newer Democrats, the Bergerfield uh, had a group of people that came in, the Wassermans, Al Struz, and they, they supported the library as well. So that, that effect in the party split with the Democrats, going with the Republicans to support this building is really another reason why we're here. No, you're exactly correct. The, the final vote was a four to two vote in the council. I was there that night again. I was, I was very interested at the time. And the, the two Democrats at the time were Jim Lodato and Patrick Hayes. And they, vote, they were Brennan Democrats. So they voted against the library. Now, I understand that at least one of them uh, later told Jimmy. Said, said he was glad the library was yeah, built sure and, and felt bad about voting no. But I think he was just being a party line guy. But he, Bobby's exactly right. It, it took uh, the combination of Republican votes and a couple of Democratic votes to, to support the library. And it's been an important part of our borough. May I invite you to the Bergenfield Museum. Bergenfield history is alive and going today. It will be open from 1 to 3 today and every Saturday. Well, I'm we'll very glad pleased to, to hear that. Very pleased to hear that because uh, all of these I things want, we have there. I, I, want, I want you to keep it going. And I'm sure you have so many images I could have added to this uh, presentation. Do come and see. It's would, living history. I would love to do that. And I, long may you do what you do. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is John McGill. Uh, I've been a lifetime member uh, of Bergenville, excuse me. <coughs> and uh, when I have your book, uh, which you would sign later on. Uh, the one thing uh, I'd like to comment on is uh, with your the history of Bergenfield was that you neglected my side of town. <laughs> I live on Highland Avenue to this day. Eastside. My, my parents bought that house as a, as a new house in 1947, the year I was born. And that's the only other place I've ever lived. Uh, but the one thing is, uh, you mentioned throughout your book, you know, there were a lot of woods and everything in Bergenfield. And on that side of town, there was a lot of woods. And my development on uh, Highland Avenue was actually a farm, but it was only a block or so. And the rest was all woods below me. And I have many fond memories of that woods. Something I think kids miss today. They don't have that option. Uh, and even small amounts of woods gives you a chance to roam and be free, uh, free range kids. And you're probably right. I mean, uh, I didn't ever try to keep track of whether I was giving X percentage to any given part of town, but I think you're probably correct. I just didn't know enough about it, and I didn't know people who could tell me more about it. But your point is well taken, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm originally from Wolfsburg. It's a pretty urbanized area. A friend of mine had an uncle, some of you might have known, David Tom Powers. Oh, yeah. Sure. Certainly. Tom Bergenfield. And he used to come up here, my friend used to come up here in the uh, summer, and we'd always say, yeah, I'm going to the country. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Tom Powers was, of course, the proprietor of Bergen Rec for many years, and a wonderful person. Uh, much missed. Uh, thanks for that comment. That uh, reminded me of Tom. I, I spent many a profitable hour, or at least uh, many a happy hour, in the Bergen Rec. Yes. Uh, could you give us a couple of, just a quick one, the population 50 years ago, 100 yeah, yeah. years ago? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in the 1920s, it would have been a, a little bit about 11, 12,000. Uh, when I was growing up, it reached its peak in the 60s. Uh, I think we came very close to 30,000 people, and it has since declined slightly because of smaller families. You know, I had, a, on my neighborhood, in Harcourt Avenue, there's a family that had uh, 13 kids. I had an uncle who had 15 kids. I mean, nobody does that anymore. Uh, one of them is here today. <laughs> so, so, you know, but, that's right, Peter's here. Uh, you know, 
large families were much more common, and and more commonly was the four or five kid family, you know, as opposed to the very very large family. But that, that's why we're, we decline somewhat, even though we may have actually more dwellings. Remember where the Patterson Orchids was? There's housing. If you went down Melrose Avenue toward the Little League Field, there was a whole woods there. I didn't write about it in my book, but I used to ride my bike past it. Now it's got duplexes on it. You've got where Pierce Steamer's big estate was. You've got all those houses now. Uh, on Holberg and Prospect, right? Uh, so you have more housing, but you don't have as many people. Uh, but Bergenfield at its inception, sir, was very tiny. You know, if it had a thousand people, it had a lot. I had a question, just a comment talking about the books. Uh, we have just a couple of copies, but uh, and please don't uh, stampede over here. A country of El Salvador and uh, the Huguenot settlement of Schrallenberg, they both circulate. I think Bergenfield's done pretty well with its histories. <laughs> Anybody else, Bob? Some people know we have a seminary place and a seminary court. And there was, a, I guess it was at an old mansion, a Russian Orthodox seminary. Oh, and that became St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in Valhalla, New York, which I think is one of the major Eastern Orthodox seminaries in the United States today, and kind of a center of Eastern Orthodox learning. It's a bit of hidden history of Bergenfield, and Bob's absolutely right. Absolutely. So there are things about Bergenfield history. Richmond's Rest. Some of you may remember Richmond's Rest. You know, an amazing little piece of Bergenfield history. And Eli, who's a former police officer in town, uh, he was in every nook and cranny of this town, so he remembers a lot of the Bergenfield history that has disappeared. Um, and that's just the way it is in the world, you know? It's, it doesn't stay still. Hey, look, you've been here a long time. Thank you so much. And, uh,